Good morning, St. Mark's. Good morning. All right. Ooh, I didn't see you guys there. Friends, my name is James Adkins. I'm the Contemporary Worship Director here at St. Mark's, and I am so blessed and happy to be here this morning with you lovely, happy people. It is just so good to see you on this day that God has given us this morning. Let's all rise together as we sing, God will lift up your head. This is one of them joyful songs, you know. Give to the wind your fear and hope be undismayed. God hears your sighs and counts your tears. God will lift up God will lift up, God will lift up your head, He'll lift up your head, He will lift up your head, God will lift up your head, He will lift up your head, God will lift up. God will lift up, He will lift up your head. Leave to His sovereign sway to choose and to command. Then shall we wandering on his way know how wise and how strong how wise and how strong God will lift up your head. Through waves and clouds and storms, He gently clears the way. Wait, cause in His time so shall this night soon end in joy, soon end in joy. Soon and enjoy. It'll soon and enjoy. God will lift up your It'll soon and enjoy. God will lift up your It'll soon and enjoy. days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, his righteousness being restored. And oh, these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. 
Still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white as your world. Still we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah, 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 there's no God like Jehovah. Alright, we're gonna do that again, here we go. There's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. So lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. <laughs> it's a blast from the past, huh? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much. We just thank you for, for all the blessings in our lives. We thank you for, for life, for the experiences that, that you have put into motion in our lives. Father, we thank you for your guidance and we ask for your guidance. Uh, just be with us. Help to mold us into the people that you want us to be. Help us be closer to your image. And Father, this morning be with Dan as he brings your message and just help us to just, just take it into our lives and make it a part of who we are. In your heavenly name, amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, 
You rose in glorious life. You're forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection when we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. That's like my favorite thing. It's like, good morning. It wasn't loud enough. My ears aren't bleeding. Yell louder, right? So I'm um, glad you are here today. I'm Dan. I'm one of the pastors here and would love for you to grab your Connect card. It's on the end of your row. Fill it out and uh, let us know if you have any prayer requests on the back or need any other information, you can put in the offering basket on your way out along with any offering that you might have. If you are watching online, we are so glad you are with us. There's an online connect card in the comment section, and so uh, I would ask that you'd fill that out. There should also be a link to be able to give online if you'd like to do that, and uh, we are just glad that you are with us today. Also, at the end of your rows, you might have noticed this blue flyer for the St. Mark's United Methodist Church Church Picnic. And uh, we're going to be doing that uh, coming up on June 12th. We are coming up on a new sermon series here in a couple of weeks called Breaking Bread with Jesus. And we're going to be talking about all the different times when Jesus had meals with people and, and what that meant. And uh, so we're going to use that as an opportunity for us to have some times where we have some meals together, one of them being this church picnic. So it's going to be at Riverbend Park, 4 to 7. We'll provide hot dogs and drinks and table service and bring us some food to share. If you got your fishing license, we're gonna be right by a little pond. Bring your pole and uh, we'll have a good time together. So I hope that you will come and be a part of that. Next week though, uh, before we start that sermon series, next week is our Celebration Sunday. We're only having one service and it's at 10 a.m. in the church. Next week, we're having one service at 10 a.m. It's over in the church. If you come at 1115, you can help clean up from the service that just finished because it's at 10 a.m. in the church. And uh, it's going to be a celebration Sunday. We're going to have baptisms. We're going to celebrate our graduates. We've got confirmands. We've got new members. We've got teacher recognition, all sorts of great stuff. I hope that you will come and be a part of that. It's a really, really exciting Sunday in the life of our church. So come and be a part of that. I uh, also want to let you know this. If you go to stmarksfinley.org and click on the events tab, there are several things coming up, especially for our children's ministry, that I want to make sure you see. So 
uh, we got something coming up. I don't know if you remember, uh, a couple weeks ago for Mother's Day, we, we handed out some lovely tulips uh, for all the ladies. So for guys, what we're going to be doing is an all-out Nerf battle. Um, so, so there is, a, what, I forget what it's called, the Battle Royale. Dads and kids, uh, grandpas, whoever, uh, uncles, bring your kids, and uh, we're going to have all the Nerf, the, the Nerf War stuff going on. Uh, so that'll be a really good time. I uh, hope that you will come out and be a part of that. You can sign up for that and get more information on the website. Also coming up is our Vacation Bible School. It's going to be a food truck theme. It's called on a, a Food Truck Party on a Roll with God, right? So again, this whole theme of dining with each other. And there will be a night. So sign up your kids for Vacation Bible School. But there will also be a night where we're going to have all the food trucks out here. And uh, everybody's going to be invited to come eat. And it will be a really good time. And, uh, and then there's uh, one other thing. Uh, there's a day camp that's going to be coming up. It's kind of a traveling day camp um, that the kids are going to get to do. They're going to get to go all over the place. Uh, go swimming out at my house, all sorts of fun stuff. So, um, yeah, check that out, stmarksfinley.org, and you can go to the events tab and see all of those things and get some more information. Corinne, we'll go ahead and invite you to come up and have our children's moment. Hello. Oh, wow. Hey, we're hot. We got it. Hello, hello. Good morning. Hello there. How are you today? Good? Shake your head, yeah? Good? Yeah? Bad? Terrible? Awful? No? Okay. All right. So, today, I have a little challenge for you. It's going to be a challenge for me, too. Hold on. You don't know. All right. I want to see if you guys can poke a hole in this paper. Can you try it? Try, yeah, try it with your finger first. Let's see if we can do it. Oh, okay. Another one? Try it. Try it. Not near the other hole. Okay, yep. He's got two hands. That could be considered cheating. Okay, here. Hold on. I'll give you help. Here. Okay. Okay, try it. Don't stab me. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> your turn. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Do it. You got it. Oh, here, okay, you did here, you got it. Don't stab me. I'm still here. Oh, you got it. That was pretty easy. It's easier when it's sharper, huh? You wanna try it? You gonna use your finger? You can try your finger. It's kinda of hard with your finger. They're not sharp enough here. Try it. Oh, got my leg. She got me. You try, you wanna try it? You can stab it. You wanna do it with your finger? Okay. Oh! My goodness. Here, you can try. You don't want to do it? Oh, you want to use your finger? Okay, try. Okay, well, okay. All right, we're going to. You guys are awesome. You did a great job. Next time we'll do not scary challenges. Okay. Okay. Okay, wow. So it was pretty easy when you had something sharp, right? Like it went right well. You just. A pen would have been easy. I figured a pencil, it would be less damaging. I don't know, it was pretty scary. So let's try it again. But this time I'm going to add something to the back of, well, my paper is a little destroyed. We'll see what we can do with this paper. OK. We can have our own. OK, now let's try it. Do it this way. OK. Use the eraser, though, so we don't stab. Use the eraser. Oh, look, paper, OK. Let's use this big paper. Okay, ready? Okay, try to put a hole in it. Not with the pen. Please don't stab me. Turn it around. Didn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. My turn. Yep. You gonna try it? Yeah, try it with the eraser side. Not working, huh? Try it. Can you poke a hole through that? Oh, you're being a trickster. You trickster. I'm trying to. All right, try to get the hole in there. Oh. Almost. He's so strong. He has some aggression issues. You gonna try? Ready? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So it's a whole lot harder to tear through something when there's something.
something strong and solid behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't make a hole in it when there was something strong backing it up. You might have noticed that this poor Bible, I'm so sorry. It was already ripped, so it's fine. It's okay. So you might have noticed that I had my Bible behind it, right? And that put something strong and solid behind it, and it was harder to poke a hole through it. So the scripture in this Bible is also quite powerful, and it can help us too. When we face challenges or struggles, the Bible provides us with a strong weapon to defeat them. God has given us his words to remember, to reminder that he is always with us. Did you know that Jesus used scripture to defeat Satan? You knew that? That's good. Jesus was in the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil. Do you know what it means to be tempted? Have you... Oh. You want to do something you know you're maybe not supposed to do? Have you seen those videos that were on America's Funniest Home Videos where they put candy in front of their toddler and they walked away and said, don't eat these till I come back. And they all ate them. It's, it's a good show. I bet they do. It's good. Yeah, so they would put candy in front of their little kid and they're like, okay, don't eat it. And they would walk away. But they were videotaping them and they didn't know it. Is that funny? And the kids would be like, he did it. Talking about the dog, right? Yeah, because he actually did it. Yeah. So temptation means you might want to do something, but you know you shouldn't do it. Now, wanting to do it isn't a sin. But we don't want to give in to those temptations, right? So the devil was trying to tempt Jesus into things he knew he shouldn't do. And Jesus quoted verses from the Bible to defeat those lies that the devil was telling him. God's words were the weapon he used to defeat temptation. Even the devil can't stand up against scripture. So this story reminds me of some very happy truths. I like happy. Do you like happy things? No. Okay, well. He's his dad's son. So Jesus is always with us. And he knows what we are going through because he went through those same things. He understands our struggles, and he can help us through them, right? Jesus also assures us that nothing will come our way that will be too much for us to handle if we lean on him. So the Bible isn't just a book of stories. It's a weapon against evil, right? If we try to handle all of our challenges on our own, it's like this single piece of paper. It was easy to poke through and defeat. But with scripture backing us up, nothing could get through, right? So let's pray together and thank God for his strong words, okay? Dear God, thank you for helping us to stand up against temptation. Thank you for your words in the Bible. Please help us to read them and trust in them. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can, you got it. Backstage kids. And the nursery is also open today if anybody needs it. I think that was the fastest I've ever seen a move to the backstage. <laughs> they were just energized by your lesson. That's what it is. <laughs> There's a I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail If there's an anchor for my soul I can say that it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won and he is risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my no more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my 
Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians, uh, just one verse in chapter 10, verse 13. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So we have been walking through this sermon series called Bumper Sticker Faith. And um, I don't know if you've like been paying extra attention to the bumper stickers you've seen or, or anything like that. Uh, but we've been um, talking about how these phrases and verses are ones that we sometimes take out of context 
and twist to mean something that they don't. <coughs> the intent is not to make anyone feel bad. If one of these verses has been important to you, the intention is to take a fresh look at some of our bumper sticker faith and theology and to review what some of these passages really mean to make our faith stronger in a way that stands the test of time and withstands the troubles and trials we face. I think a good, good rule of thumb is this. Just because it fits on a bumper sticker or a coffee mug or it rhymes, it doesn't mean it's true, right? If it fits on a bu- I, would, I would in fact say if it fits on a bumper sticker, probably isn't good theology. It, it, you probably need to go into it a little bit deeper. And so today we're looking at this passage from 1 Corinthians 10, and it usually leads to this phrase, maybe you've seen it on a bumper sticker or a plaque at Cracker Barrel or Hobby Lobby or your grandma used to say it, and it says, God won't give you more than you can handle. Has anyone ever said that to you? Have you ever seen that? God won't give you more than you can handle. So when I hear that phrase, I'm reminded of something. There was this commercial uh, just a little while back that I remember seeing, and they were advertising paper plates. There's a guy who makes this lovely meal of spaghetti and meatballs for his date that he's invited over to his apartment. He's going to really impress her. He's got candles. He's, got, he's dressed up. He's got spaghetti and meatballs. His date comes in. She's wearing a nice white dress. And so he serves her spaghetti and meatballs on this flimsy paper plate. And what happens? It falls right on her lap. Now, if he had only used a nicer paper plate for his day, of course she would have been totally impressed. Because who's not impressed by a date who uses paper plates? But it was like this idea that it's just not strong enough. Sometimes if they had only had the three layers of paper magic that like the really fancy brand has, then then she would have just said, would you marry me right here on the spot, right? The plate couldn't handle, couldn't handle it, but their plate, the nice plate can handle whatever's thrown its way. And, and sometimes, have you ever had, I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase or you've said this, have you ever said, I've got too much on my plate? Like, I've just got too much on my plate. My plate is full right now. I can't take anymore. Sometimes we can't, we feel like we can't handle what life is throwing our way. And then along comes someone who sees our trouble, who sees us struggling with everything that life is throwing our way, and they come up and they put their arm around us and they say, hey man, God won't give you more than you can handle. And you just want to take that plate of spaghetti and meatballs and dump it on their head. Because sometimes life just does give you more than you can handle. It, God, it seems like God is constantly giving me more than I can handle. And look, I know that through this sermon series we've been doing some things and they've just been kind of like, okay, that's fine. It's, it's kind of funny. It's, it's, a, it's a cute little antidote. Um, you know, uh, we talked about 1 Corinthians 13 last week. Okay, it's not, Paul didn't intend for that to be read at weddings. It's really about the agape love of Christ in the church, like we get it. Is it really that big of a deal though? I'm here to tell you that this verse is incredibly important. I would say life and death important that we get this right, that we say this right. And here's why. So May is Mental Health Awareness Month, right? And a scientific study was just released in March that showed that since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a 25% increase in diagnosed depression and anxiety. Mental health issues are so much more prevalent than you think they are. 21% of U.S. adults have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder, 21%. 17% of 
of kids 6 to 17 have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Here's what this means. One in five of you that walked through the doors this morning, and I, you can include me in that number, have been diagnosed with anxiety or depression or PTSD or any other number of mental health issues. To contrast that, 8% of adults say they suffer from chronic back pain. Now, almost every grown-up I know suffers from chronic back pain. Like, I feel like that is super prevalent. So if after the service, I, and I'm not telling you to do this, but if after the service I said, hey, I need everybody to help us clean up these chairs, pick them up, and, and put chairs away, and you came up to me and said, I can't help, I have chronic back pain, and I put my arm around you and said, hey man, God won't give you more than you can handle, grab some chairs. You would say, that's not the way this works, right? I'm injured, I can't do it. But by that same token, when we see someone who's going through deep grief or loss or just feeling paralyzed by life and struggling with their own mental health, we have a tendency to use this, this saying and say, hey man, God won't give you more than you can handle. Get back out there. Because when we say these words, God won't give you more than you can handle, we're almost always talking about what you can handle emotionally mentally and spiritually. There's two big problems with that. Sometimes we do get more than we can handle emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Just like I can't lift any weight no matter what just because I'm a person of faith, in the same way, there are some things psychologically that are just too heavy. And it doesn't matter that I'm a person of faith. We can't always carry every load. Because it's been read this way for so long, there's this perception that when life becomes too heavy to bear... If you struggle with it in some way, if you end up with anxiety, depression, PTSD, or a host of other issues, it must be because of your lack of faith. And I'm here to tell you today, that is absolutely untrue. That is just plain not true. So in the Gospels, we, we often point to the physical suffering that Jesus endured, right? And he eventually succumbed to. But there's something we sometimes miss about the emotional, mental, and spiritual anguish that he went through for us. We know about the physical suffering, right? We know that even at one point, the cross itself was too physically heavy for him to bear on his own. And so they had to get a guy to come in and help carry it. Even Jesus couldn't lift every physical weight in that moment. And there was also times when the mental, emotional, and spiritual anguish was so heavy that Jesus wasn't able to lift it just on his own. That's not blasphemy, I promise. It's just true. The Scripture tells us about it. In Matthew 26, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before he's arrested. And it says that he began to be sorrowful and troubled and Jesus says this to his disciples. He, he brings Peter and James and John, his three closest friends. He draws them in closer. He says, like, I need you guys. He says, my soul, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here with me and keep watch with me. Like, I need you guys right now. This is too heavy for me to bear by myself. 
It's not because Jesus didn't have faith. He was human also, right? Fully God, fully man. He experienced everything we experience. In, in modern day interpretation of what Jesus was experiencing, we'd call it something like anxiety. Anxiety attack, whatever you want to call it. And I think that if in that moment Peter had gone to Jesus and put his arm around him and said, hey Jesus, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. Peter might have tasted the back of Jesus' hand. Because it's just not true. Sometimes in life we get more than we can handle. It's too heavy for us to carry on our own. And here's the second problem with this saying, God won't give you more than you can handle. You might have seen it on a plaque. You might have seen it on a bumper sticker. It's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in Scripture. Right? It's not. It's just not. The closest that, that the Scripture comes to this platitude that people off, offer, I know with good intentions, it's just not helpful. The closest is likely our Scripture that we read, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, <coughs> which says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Right? But when you are tempted... He will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Let's talk about temptation. I'm not talking about life circumstance. It's something entirely different. But when we read this verse, we might hear in our mind's eye that, that old adage, and we might think, God's not going to fill up my plate to the point of crashing, right? God will ensure I can carry it all. I can handle all this. God won't give me more than I can handle. But then what happens? We crash. We all inevitably do. At some point in life, things just get really, really heavy. And we begin to feel, because it's hard for us to carry, or because we can't carry that weight that life has dumped on us, that there must be something wrong with us. There must be something wrong with my faith, with my trust in God. And we start to doubt God because of this quippy motto that we've turned this verse into. How did we get here? How did we get from this scripture in 1 Corinthians to, to saying God won't give you more than you can handle? So, again, I, I keep saying this, but you've got to go back to the context. Who's Paul talking to? and What's he talking about? He's talking to people from Corinth. They are baby Christians, right? In this book overall, that's who Paul's talking to. People who three or four years ago had never heard of Jesus until Paul came. And he tells them about Jesus, and he starts all these little house churches, and now he's writing a letter back to them. And it's not going well for them because they're immature Christians. He says, I've given you milk because you're not ready for solid food, right? He's given them the very basics. He's given them simple stuff because they don't get it yet. And he, and he says, you know, yeah, look, you're young, you're growing in your faith, you're just not there yet. And he also has called them worldly. And it, it's because of where they were. They were in Corinth. Corinth had a lot going on, okay? This is a cosmopolitan city. It's a big city, lots of action, money, extravagant lifestyles, right? Pagan temples with religious worship, uh, which meant lots of idols, lots of drunkenness, lots of what the Bible generally considers debauchery, right? Like bad stuff going on all the time. Think spring break in Vegas Bible times, right? Like that's kind of what Corinth is at that time. Lots of temptation. But Paul started this church, this collection of house churches in Corinth, and they're trying to learn and grow in their faith. And Paul is encouraging them in his letter, and he sees, you know, you got a lot of issues that need addressed, and you're failing to look a lot different from Corinth. You've got to resist temptation. I know it's, it's all around you, but you've got to resist temptation. And in chapter 10, he gives them a little bit of a history lesson. He says, look, your religious ancestors, the, the Hebrews, they came out of slavery in Egypt, and they, they saw all the amazing things God had done. They saw uh, how God brought them out of slavery. He's, they saw 
the Red Sea part. They saw manna fall to the ground. They saw God lead them with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And even then, they fell into temptation with the people around them. Even, like, don't we pray for that all the time, that we could just, like, see God, that we would know God's leading us? God was visibly leading them, and they still found ways to just find themselves in sin, like they couldn't help it. Paul's saying, look, you, you've got to resist that thing. You have got to try to stay away. You've got to be different, right? You've got to be different than all that. I know it's hard. There's so many things to distract you, right? Lots of activities to join in. But Paul's urging them. You've got to remember the past. Remember, there's other people watching you. He goes back, and so back to the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, these things happened to them, the Israelites, as an example and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Then he says, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out. Therefore, my friends, flee from idolatry. Right? And so that's what this was about. He's saying, I know it's tempting, but there's no temptation, first of all, that everybody else has an experience, and second of all, that is so tempting that there's no way out for you, that you're just like, I had to sin, I didn't have a choice, right? Like, no, there's always going to be a way out. And so this is a message and a warning and an encouragement to a whole group. And by the way, to the whole group, not just a message to one person, not just God won't tempt you beyond what you can bear, but God won't tempt y'all beyond what y'all can bear, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a community kind of statement. We're going to be experiencing this together, never in isolation. And we should approach it as a, as a community of faith. No temptation is overtaken Y'all, beyond what is common to mankind. No temptation. Some scriptures actually say, test it. Um, Paul tells them that no temptation or testing is going to happen to you in Corinth differently than what's happened to the rest of the history of people or has happened to people in other places. And by the way, that's an interesting concept because so many people today talk about how bad society is, how things are so much worse. We are going to hell in a handbasket, right? You've probably heard that. And it's just not true um, that, that it's worse. No temptation has overtaken us except which is common to mankind, okay? It's just that we get the news all the time. It used to be like 40 years ago or whatever, like Walter Cronkite gave you 30 minutes of bad news and the rest of it was fine. You just live your life, right? Now we get 24-7 like, you just leave the news on in the background and just glance at the TV every now and then. Is everything still horrible? Yeah, I guess it is. Like, and it's just, that's how we kind of do it now, right? But nothing has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And when those things come around, God is faithful. He doesn't let you be tempted or tested beyond what you can bear. He provides a way out. In other words, you are never forced to sin. There's always a choice. There's always a way out. But if you go back to the original bumper sticker phrase, when we say, God won't give you more than you can handle, like if you turn it into that, then we're inferring that the things that are happening to us are coming from God, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. It implies that God is testing us, that, that God is, is just piling the, on this flurry of negative life experiences that are coming your way and filling up your plate to, to the point where God just stops just short of it all being too much. I don't find that helpful in any way. And I also don't find it correct. First James, or, or first James, James 1.13 actually tells us that God won't tempt us. The concept of God tempting us is, is cruel, and it sits in a total opposition to the imagery we have of God as a loving parent. And the verse, the actual scripture, doesn't allude to that in any way. What the verse tells us 
is that things are going to come your way in life, whether it's temptation or testing, and it's not uncommon at all. It's, it's, it's life when we face sickness and financial worries and stress and, uh, about family or the world or anxiety or depression, all of these things, whatever it might be, it's not your fault for not being Christian enough. It's not your fault. The world is broken. There's pain, there's hurt, there's sadness. Jesus tells us this, right? John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. You're going to. You know why? Because life sometimes gives you more than you can handle. Whether it's good or bad news, that life stuff is not uncommon. It's, it's life that gives us all that we can handle and then some. But it's God who's faithful. It's Jesus who says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Right? There's hope. The worst thing is never the last thing. Healing is real. He really can be our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. That's true. And when Paul is, it, what Paul in his letter to the Corinthians is saying is, stop your idol worshiping, stop your drunken orgies, which were a matter of fact in the pagan temples, stop all that stuff, stop looking so much like the rest of Corinth, stop chasing after things that don't bring you closer to God, because your ancestors went there and it didn't end up well for them. Don't go chasing after things that you know are testing or temptation, because what's actually happening is you are giving yourself more than you can handle. Right? Did you hear that? Because it's true for us too. Don't go chasing after things in this world that will cause you to fail. That's you giving yourself more than you can handle. Don't let the things of the world tempt you into leaving the peace that you find in Jesus. Don't let pressure pull you away from what's true. Don't bow to all of that. And the verse tells us that God provides a way out for us. He always provides a way. When life throws too much or we add too much for our own selves to bear, God provides a way out. And when we struggle, God provides a community to provide that way out. We are here to help each other along the road toward God, not, not towards more temptation and testing. And that takes us back to the garden. When Jesus felt sorrow and grief to the point of death, when the anxiety and the mental strain was too much, he asked his closest friends, Peter and James and John, to come a little closer, to pray with him, to carry it with him a little bit, just like he would need Simon of Cyrene to help carry the cross. He asked his friends to come closer and help bear his burdens. Even Jesus needed community when life got too heavy. And I want you to know that's what our community, that's what the church is meant to do. We bear one another's burdens. When someone has too much to carry physically, when you see somebody carrying something too heavy, what do you do? You go and you take an end of whatever it is they're carrying and you help, right? And in the same way, we bear one another's burdens when it's when it's something that's, that's too much to carry inside, we come closer and we pray. We bear one another's burdens. Your plate is often full. And it might even spill all over. That happens. Because life does sometimes give you more than you can handle. Family gets sick. People die, bills pile up, things break, relationships end. God doesn't send that our way, and God doesn't expect us to always be able to hold it all together, to always handle it on our own. We need one another, and we need God, and God wants to help. If we continue to believe and to tell others that God will, won't give you more than you can handle, then we become leery of God, suspicious. We wonder, what do we do? Why does God have it out for me, right? And, and if we try living by this God won't give you more than you can handle mantra, there's a good chance we might give up because it feels defeating after a while. 
They constantly have a plate that's not able to hold it all. That God is faithful, not spiteful. And if our plate feels full and heavy and too much to bear, using this imagery of the paper plate, in those situations, that's where God comes along and adds another stronger plate under ours. We're still holding these things, but God gives us a hand. He cooperates with us. And oftentimes that comes in the form of the community he has given us to help carry these things. I don't give too many absolutes. I give a lot of suggestions, a lot of new ways to kind of look at and think about something. I'm going to give you an absolute today. Please stop saying God gives you only what you can handle or that God won't give you more than you can handle. Please stop saying that. It's just not true. It's not in the Scripture. There's going to be pain. Life dumps a lot on our plates. And there will be times when we need to stand with others in their pain and their full plates. And, and hopefully they'll stand with you in your pain, in your full plate. And God gives us the strength to bear one another's burdens. And when we find ourselves in the place of suffering, God is faithful to support us, to cooperate with us in that. God is faithful to provide a way out. Would you pray with me? Jesus, when we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, when we find ourselves in that place where it is too heavy, where we can't bear it all on our own, remind us that you call us to you, to a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light that you bear our burdens for us, and that in that we bear one another's burdens as well. So give us eyes to see those who are are just caring too much and who need a friend to come and to stand alongside them and and to hold them up. And when we're in those places where it's just too heavy, give us the courage to reach out to those around us who like Peter and James and John will come close to us and pray with us and bear our burdens just as they helped you do. Jesus, we're thankful for a community that loves us and that loves you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve. And though I'm weak and poor, 
for all I have is yours every single breath and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required I've searched much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you when it's all about you I shared this at the first service. When I got in this morning, it was just kind of one of those, it's been a heavy week, right? And when I got in this morning, you know, it, I had suffered some, some loss. We had celebrated uh, Chris Allen's life last week and all, all these other things. And I just feel a little bit heavy this morning. And I got in and I found in my mailbox a card from somebody that just said, I just want you to know I'm praying for you and I care about you, somebody from this church. And that's exactly what this stuff is. That's bearing one another's burdens. That's just saying, I see you, and I know you're carrying something heavy. And it lifted me up, and it made me feel a little lighter. How can you bear one another's burdens this week? How can you find ways to say, this is feeling really heavy, and I need a little bit of help? Let's do that together. Let's live that kind of community together. And as we do, I pray God gives all of us faith. And Christ gives us peace, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to share that gospel of God's perfect love. Amen. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet's call, lift you.